Up next, we have Girls Will Be Girls, written and directed by Suchi Talati. So this film is set at a Himalayan boarding school, which in itself was so unique and so interesting. I also think the dynamic of mothers and daughters and how that can then be disrupted by young men, <laughs> you know, as one begins to learn about romance and, 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 and feelings and, and cooties. No, I'm kidding. But no, as one begins to understand more about their body, their sexuality, and, you know, how they see, you know, attraction and all that, and then how that conflicts with being a child, you know, being your parent's child and this kind of weird triangle that happens as a result of that. It was very unique, very refreshing, even in how it, it approaches sexuality. It's very, very different. And I think this, to use Sebastian as an example, I understand it's completely different films, but I at least appreciated that it was trying to delve into the naivete and and just the wonder, you know, of young people trying to make sense of their place in the world and what their bodies are supposed to do and all these things that are happening as they're getting older. So one, I really appreciate it, like different kind of insight. But like I said, I love just the cultural perspective and how that can shift from film to film, even though the coming of age experience is so universal. Speaking of which, we have up next, Dee Dee, directed by Sean Wong, which in Mandarin means little brother which is very fitting because it centers around a young boy who again is coming of age. And this particular story takes place in like, well, late 2000s, 2008, in the midst of the rise of social media and the internet and messenger of all these things. Lord, you know, experiences that I have mostly fun, not always fun, you know, memories of, but it was such, it was so hilarious. And even under that hilarity, because some of it is just the relatability of, gosh, I remember when I was that age. I remember when I was in high school and I remember <laughs> some of the shenanigans and dealing with friends and, you know, crushes and school and yes I loved how this dealt with coming of age much like girls will be girls from a different cultural experience this of course is dealing with the immigrant experience as Dee Dee is Taiwanese American and his family is Taiwanese so you know dealing with that cultural conflict understanding that what you've come from represents one thing but now here in America that represents something else and the conflicts that come, especially as you get older and you're trying to make sense of the world. And it's just another film that I thought was refreshing and just was just so relatable in so many ways. Up next, we have Rob Peace, written and directed by Chiwetel Ejiofor and starring Jay Will, Mary J. Blige, and of course, Chiwetel Ejiofor. It is based on a biography that I will not list because it will give away <laughs> the story. I knew nothing about it going in, which I'm glad because it would have probably set my expectations a different way. So if you can manage to avoid that, please do. I love Chiwetel Ejiofor and I enjoy him as an actor. I think he's, I think he's appreciated, but he's also underappreciated, kind of like Laura Linney. And he's always solid. I enjoy him in pretty much anything he does. And I was surprised to learn that this is actually not his feature directorial debut. That is actually 2019's The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. I loved seeing this story about Rob rising through the ranks and really making the most of his intelligence and his awareness, but there also being a conflict with his origins. Like, what has he been surrounded by? What has his circumstances been, you know, as a young child? And how does that now shape him as he grows older? What is he fighting for? What does he believe in? What is his mother kind of standing in between the balance of what his father's influence is, what she hopes for him? Like, there's a lot of, of dynamics here. I would say the performances are great, and I think the story is definitely impactful. I would say that it's a little emotionally disconnected. I appreciate Mary J, but I don't think she's the most captivating actress, even though I understand she's done films like Mudbound, which I still haven't seen, but it just got very disconnected emotionally. So I do think it fell short on that front, but overall it was one that in all of its complications, it definitely was a story I appreciated being able to see and hear. 
All right, and now we have Your Monster, directed by Carolyn Lindy. I think the title is very self-explanatory. We have a young woman who is dealing with very tragic circumstances. And in the midst of those circumstances, she happens upon a monster in her closet. <laughs> and the progression of that relationship is what drives the film. And if there's one thing I have to say about this, it's not like I ever thought Melissa Barrera was untalented because my introduction to her was in the film In the Heights, which I think she was pretty solid in. Then with Scream and all that, Scream is fine, but no one has to have Oscar-worthy acting for that. We're just here for the kills. But if there was ever a film to really highlight just how talented she is, it's this film. Like, <laughs> she had me laughing, had me crying had me kind of scared in a couple of moments. I really, really enjoyed it. She was almost a one woman show. There's other stuff going on, but she, she was great. I do think that the early dynamics of the main character and the monster is very kind of like, eh, okay, I think I've seen this before. You know, this is gonna be some kind of Beauty and the Beast remix. And it actually is more than that. And I think it's shocking to see <laughs> what the film uncovers about both of those characters and what the reality of that is. But definitely a charmer, uh, definitely a lot more in your face than I expected. And I think that it's one that for the most part, a lot of people are going to enjoy. And I hope they do because I absolutely enjoyed it. And when we got to that ending, whoo, <laughs> just you wait and see. All right, now we are officially in my top five, starting with Frida, directed by Carla Gutierrez. I had the chance to see this on day one of the festival. That in itself was exciting enough, but actually being able to see a documentary centered around this legendary figure that I was already familiar with, what a great experience. Hearing from Carla Gutierrez, the director herself, hearing from her team, and of course, if you've seen my short at the festival, you've heard some of my thoughts on this film. I also have an extended version on my TikTok, so you guys can go check that out. But yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot to say. I think this film does justice to the complicated, intelligent, layered, <laughs> imaginative visionary that Frida Kahlo was. And just seeing the different dynamics of who she was was very rewarding. So it's not a whole lot I can say. If you guys have Prime Video, it is officially available there. Please feel free to check it out because man, I'm probably gonna have to do a separate review even though I know it's not so much more that I can say, but what a great experience. I, I enjoyed it so, so much. Great start to the festival for sure. All right, at number four, we have It's What's Inside, written and directed by Greg Jardin. Unfortunately, I can't say too much about this one because I don't want to give anything away. All I will say is that it concerns a group of friends that come together and they discover that one person in their friend group has brought along a suitcase. And naturally, what is inside their suitcase takes them on an increasingly shocking and perilous journey. <laughs> I know it's like, oh man, what is that? I didn't know anything going in. It was just like, okay, there's a suitcase, something's in it, what's going on? Wow. I don't know what I was expecting, but this, this, this threw me for a loop. And I can't wait till more people are able to see it. I was so excited to see Brittany O'Grady because I was already familiar with her from the first season of The White Lotus. And I thought she was such a great protagonist in this film. And things escalate very quickly. You kind of think you're going in one direction and then something happens and it's like, yo, <laughs> what is this? So yes, I know that's very vague, but I don't want to ruin it. But when It's What's Inside comes out, please, please go see it for yourselves because yes, awesome experience. And at number three, we have a very intense and whew, very timely film called Sugarcane, directed by Julian Brave Noise Cat and Emily Cassie. This film, which is also a documentary, is centered around an investigation into abuse and missing children at an Indian residential school, which then ignites this unexpected reckoning on the Sugarcane Reserve. I was hesitant to watch this because I knew that the subject matter was going to be a lot. And sometimes 
really sensitive material like this, especially when it comes to the handling or mishandling of children. And I have to really prepare myself for things like that. And there are a lot of warnings, even when you watch it. So if you watch this one, prepare yourself. When I was watching this, I thought of the really great conversations I've had with an awesome YouTube pal of mine, Foxtail Cinematics, and the importance of Native Indigenous representation and storytelling and so on and how important that is and even how important it is for me, again, like with Sundance as an example, seeing these stories being told, it's unfortunate that it's such, you know, dire circumstances, but there was something also painful, but also so cathartic about seeing the reality of America and just another dark chapter as it pertains to these communities and these marginalized people who have experienced things I will never have to understand, you know? I mean, wanting to understand, but, you know, like, I can never fully understand it, but it was something about seeing that and, and going through that journey and, man, the tears. It's a tough one. But I appreciated the bravery and the confidence of everyone involved in really showcasing a slice of life as it relates to the Native and Indigenous experience that is not often talked about. So with caution, I do think this is definitely worth the watch. But again, please prepare yourself because once it's over, there's a lot of releasing you're going to have to do. At number two, we have Exhibiting Forgiveness, written and directed by Titus Kafar. I was already excited for this because Andre Holland, another one who I feel like is always solid, but I don't know if people really understand like what a great actor he is. Seeing him paired with Andre Day, who was so solid in the US versus Billie Holiday, man, this film hit hard. I was also so excited to see Anjanu Ellis Taylor. And I'm not familiar with John Earl Jelks, but man, all of them brought their A-game to this. And again, the tears were so unexpected. But the film is, as it says, it's about an examination of forgiveness and how do we put aside the past when it bleeds so effortlessly into the present? Like, what do we do with that? And there is a song that Andre Day's character sings. And one of the lyrics that stuck out to me was, building with bricks that we were never given. And I think that is such a core element of the film. What does forgiveness actually look like? And does it actually mean what we think it means? Sometimes we have this antiquated idea of what forgiveness is, but it's so complicated. It's so layered. And what it requires from us and the work we have to do to fully embrace forgiveness, this film really tackles that. So I thought it was, it was a really resonant piece of work. Again, tears were coming, but at the end of it, I was like, man, you guys really did your job. So absolutely had to put this one at number two. And at number one, we have the documentary Daughters, directed by Natalie Ray and Angela Patton. This film captures the experiences of these young girls who are preparing for this special daddy-daughter dance with their fathers who are incarcerated as a part of this very unique program in a Washington, D.C. jail. I have to say I was really iffy about this one. Sometimes I am so scared by the idea of encountering Black trauma narratives and having that experience that sometimes it's just like, oh, what are we saying with this? And what is it going to mean? Like, how am I going to feel about it? But Daughters was such a... Man, it just tackled so many different, like on a mental, emotional level, it was just so resonant. It was so beautiful. It was so heartbreaking. And what I loved about it is that it wasn't just some, you know, fairy tale story, but it also wasn't just providing this indictment of these men. It wasn't just saying something about these young girls and their mothers and the circumstances, it was like there was something that everyone had to learn. The mothers had to learn something. The daughters had to learn something. The men especially, and understanding what their actions have done to separate them from their daughters and what it means to really understand what they have lost as a result of that. 
Oh, it was a lot. And it also dealt with the prison system and understanding the things that are put in place to further create the vision and further undermine these families and the units that they are trying to create in the wake of these circumstances. So Daughters, I can't wait till it comes out because I feel like everyone needs to see it. And I am so happy that this ended up with not only one, but two audience awards for the US documentary competition and also an award for festival favorite. Well-deserved. I can't say anything else. I hope everyone gets a chance to see it because man, that one got me. And I'm so glad I took the opportunity to watch it. So that concludes my general ranking of Sundance. Yeah, Sundance just continues to prove why it is such a necessary and important film festival. And just the voices that it allows to be heard within an industry that does not always value those voices. I don't even mean that as far as, you know, certain races or certain cultures. I just mean when it comes to the mainstream, there are certain types of films that are prioritized and usually it's films that are going to make money. And this is the opposite of that. It's saying that regardless of whether you feel that you're that type of filmmaker, whether you feel your story, you know, may not make money or whatever it is, it's like your story has value. You have something to say and it will be heard. And I think as someone who obviously on this YouTube journey has had to reckon with the same thing, I can absolutely relate, <laughs> you know, to that sentiment. And kudos to Sundance for allowing this platform, this festival, the Institute, all of that to have a hand in pushing all that forward. It is so necessary, so important, and I am so thankful that it exists. So once again, this is D Movie Man signing off, and I'll see you with the movie.